Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on this uh, afternoon session, one of the last ones between uh, you and the end of the day. We're absolutely thrilled to have you um, to talk about the crucial issue of water, which as we've um, seen over the last day is actually always in the background somewhere, but never really gets treated in much detail and much depth. And we think that this should really change because it's fundamental for investors to get their head around this theme. And we hope that the session today will actually um, really put that at the forefront. So we're gonna spend about an hour and a half together. Um, I will uh, start off with a, a bit of a presentation on why this topic matters and matters specifically to investors. And then I'll hand over to our wonderful panelists to really deep dive into the solutions. What we really wanna get you to get out of the session today is one, for those of you who are not yet familiar with water or water related to investment, to really get a good understanding of this, but also to come out with some very concrete, actionable uh, solutions and things that you can already do to affect change on this important topic. And to start, I want to start with the story of Zoe. Zoe's two and a half years old. She's made up of about 70% water. She needs three to four times more water than an adult, proportionally, to remain healthy. And when the temperature goes up above 30, 30 degrees, she actually needs 30% more water to remain healthy. Now, Zoe lives in a country where a state study last year showed that about 15% of the groundwater has nitrate levels that are above the minimum levels set by the government. In agricultural areas, it's more than 50% of the groundwater that has nitrate levels, so runoff from agricultural um, activities that have actually come into the groundwater. The study also shows a whole bunch of novel entities, so basically micropollutants, going from pesticides, herbicides, antibiotics, all the way through to hormones that are also in the water that Zoe is drinking. But Zoe's relatively lucky. She lives in a country where 97% of homes are linked up to water treatment facilities, where there's actually a government plan to restore water and waterways to their natural state by 2090, where all of this information is publicly available and where Zoe's mother was able to get that information. And if she's interested, she can lobby the government. And the government has the money to put these contingencies in place. But as she grows up, challenges will continue to come in. Because water and our water cycle will become increasingly displaced and unbalanced. The glaciers of Zoe's beautiful mountain home lost 6% this summer. That water is essential to the hydroelectricity, which powers 60% of our electricity production. The remaining 30% is nuclear, which also depends on waterways not becoming too warm and being available where the nuclear production is being made so that we can actually get that electricity. In neighboring countries, this year, the Rhine River was so low that essential commodities couldn't actually get through anymore. And so she's lucky because this is my daughter and she's living in Switzerland. And she, that is the story of the kids that are privileged. Those are the challenges that we will face for those that have the means. But what about the children that today don't get access to clean water, that are not connected to water utilities, that are not actually in places where they get this, essential service for life, and where we know that social instability will also grow because of the water question. Because where there is no water, there is no life. And where there is diminishing water, there is no peace. It's not a surprise to me that there's going to be an event on water, investing in water for peace tomorrow. These things are inextricably linked. We always think about water as an environmental theme. In fact, it is a deeply social and human one. So I hope this makes the case for those who weren't already convinced, but I think in this audience you should be, that water is essential and that it is not just a problem over there. 
it is a problem also over here. The challenge with water, of course, is that it's really complex, but in many ways, it's also very simple. Without it, we just don't have life. This is the result of the latest um, research by the Stockholm Resilience Center, which this year came out with an, a, new, um, a new version of their planetary boundaries framework, where they actually added um, a new boundary, two new boundaries, one on green water. Green water is actually all of the water that is linked to our soils, right? What the plants use that's already stocked in the ground. So it's not just fresh water that we need in terms of what's going into our bodies, right? It's also our agriculture that's highly dependent on this green water. And as green water becomes more scarce because we unbalance the system due to climate change, what happens is the trees and the plants die, essentially. And then there is this piece on novel entities, which I mentioned, right? These pesticides, these fertilizers, all of these things that we actually need to grow our food, but as we discussed this morning, actually have come in and unbalanced the whole system. Now, the big, big challenge we have as well um, is that these things haven't really been factored into markets, right? And so we wonder how this is linked to investments. And for too long, it was actually not so linked to investments. And this picture of Mr. Milton Friedman, which I think has been with us for the last day or so, for those who have attended the summit, um, this notion that actually shareholders and, and economics should be separate from these questions around environmental and social um, has really been with us. But what Mr. Friedman didn't realize, also because he didn't have the data, was that we have massively underestimated the impact of human activities on our essential ecosystems. And I think this is really something that we're coming to terms today, which is why we have this conference and why all of these discussions are happening. But he's also, it was, it's also something that we really have to start to quantify properly. Because all of these big economic costs, linked to water, linked to climate change, are going to come back into portfolios in some way, shape, or form. In the form of insurance risks, in the forms of liabilities, in the forms of increased regulation, in the form of taxes. And so it's something we absolutely need to be knowledgeable about. And what's actually really ironic about the no such a thing as a free lunch is that ecosystem services for many years, and if you have them in balance, do offer you a free lunch, right? Clean water, air, a carbon, you know, a carbon um, cycle that, that is conducive to having a thriving human population, which is what we've seen over the last 10,000 years. And so I think this is something we need to remember, that this logic of no free lunch, if we treat nature and if we realize that capital markets are not separate from nature, but they are within nature and they need to operate with nature, we can get that back, right? But we need to radically shift our mindsets. And thankfully, this is happening. And this is not me, probably the, the financial industry equivalent of a tree-hugging hippie that's telling you this, right? The NGFS, right? The, the Network for Greening Financial Systems, which is 116 regulators, including the Fed, the Swiss National Banks, the FINMA, have said this year, nature-related risks could have significant macroeconomic and financial implications. This is really something that is mainstreaming in the regulatory mindset. And if you look at the work that's being done by the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, you can see that fresh water is at the heart of this consideration on nature. There is no nature without water. So it's absolutely key that we tackle biodiversity, that we tackle climate, that we tackle all of these issues, but we have to remember that at the heart of this, something extremely tangible, is fresh water. And actually, the freshwater impacts also what goes into our oceans, because our rivers, our streams, actually end up in our oceans. It's linked to our land, to what can grow, what doesn't grow. So this emerging realization is now really coming to the fore in finance, and I think we heard it this morning. So it's extremely important that we really dig into the risks and opportunities in this space. Now, sometimes I get pushed back, and people say, yeah, but if it's that important, why haven't we dealt with it? Or they say, well, actually, maybe it's because we don't have enough data. And that's why we've been so slow at dealing with this. We have the data. Since the mid-90s, there has been an explosion in reporting. There, we have metrics. We know 
that we have challenges to deal with. I would argue the reason we haven't actually moved is not really linked to data. It's actually linked to human nature. Right? And I read it. There's a fantastic article that was written in 2015 in The Guardian where Oliver Berkman essentially said that if a cabal of evil psychologists had gotten together in a secret undersea, undersea lair and tried to concoct a crisis humanity was hopelessly ill-equipped to deal with, they would have invented climate change. And I think it's not just climate change, right? Water, all of these issues, biodiversity loss, these are all questions that for many years were very conceptual, right? Long term, it's not something immediate that you respond to. But the quality of Zoe's water is not conceptual. The fact that our glaciers are melting and that that will impact hydroelectricity production and energy security is not conceptual. The fact that the CDP has estimated that it's gonna cost us five times more to deal with this if we don't act quickly, specifically on water risks, and that between 2022 and 2050, it's likely to cost 5.6 trillion, and these numbers just, they don't mean anything after a while, they're so big. Basically, we have a challenge, and it is today, and we need to deal with it. And we are dealing with it, and I think one of the reasons water is so central and why I'm really thrilled that we're going to be deep diving into this topic today is that it's so interlinked to every other SDG, right? One of the purposes of building bridges is to drive more understanding and more capital towards the SDGs. And this is a piece of research that came out earlier this year, which looked at the potential of water security in leveraging the 2030 agenda. And the size of the icons basically gives you how interlinked the water theme is to each of these individual SDGs. So you can see logically that it's very linked to good health and well-being. Um, it's also linked to zero hunger and to life on land for all of the reasons I've already mentioned. But it's linked to everything else. It's got a, basically a link to over 91% of all of, of the other SDGs. So it's really a positive reinforcer. And so if we deal with this issue, we actually can help have positive effects and cascading effects across the entire value chain. So this is why we're here today. What I'd really love is for us to be able to come out of this with some concrete action points, because sometimes these problems seem so daunting, so huge, <laughs> that we think it's time to, we want to, as humans, kind of stick our head in the sand and think, you know, actually it's gonna be okay or someone else will deal with the issue. No one else will deal with the issue. Every one of us has a responsibility to act in our own area. And I think that's the beauty of what Building Bridges is trying to do. Everything is interconnected, and we all have a role to play, and we can all play a role in our areas of focus where we have expertise and where our, co our companies and, and our day-to-day -day intersects with these challenges. So to get to something concrete, um, what I'd love to do is invite our wonderful panelists for today, our moderator, Hubertus Koops, who is uh, head of corporate communications, but also in charge of our group foundation, Cédric Lecon, senior investor, investment manager on water, uh, Martijn Osterwood, uh, who comes to us from UBS, as, as the lead ESG specialist in their impact, um, in their impact practice, Samuel Godfrey uh, from UNICEF, um, who is the East and Southern Africa advisor, I think who works a lot on climate resilience and water, and uh, last but not least, um, from series, Kristen James, um, who is the senior program director for water. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marilor, and welcome, everyone. It's uh, very nice to see so, so many of you here uh, on such a beautiful day. I was just uh, talking briefly to our former senior partner, Jacques de Saussure, before, and he said it's probably the nicest day that we've had uh, in the last two weeks, and it's the nicest one that we're going to have for probably a long time to come, four months, I think you said. So um, I appreciate you all taking the time, and thank you very much also to all of you uh, for, for taking the time to come today. Kirsten, uh, all the way from California, uh, and Samuel, all the way from Kenya. Uh, the other two gentlemen, I think Zurich and Geneva. Now, um, as Marilor said, uh, water matters for all of us, and it certainly also matters uh, for investors. And we will try over the next 45 minutes or so to, uh, to get to uh, a few of the concrete action items that, uh, that Marie-Laure was asking for. Um, but, uh, and I 
actually had planned to reintroduce our panelists a little bit. I don't think I have to do that now since Marie-Laure has done that, but maybe a few words on, on their respective organizations still, because uh, it may not be so clear what series does exactly and also uh, what you do uh, at UNICEF. So uh, Samuel uh, is, is more or less the water expert at UNICEF uh, for Southern and Eastern Africa. He and his team um, overlook and oversee around 200 projects uh, in around 21 countries that are related to uh, the climate, water, energy, etc. And that's actually just part of his job. Uh, Kirsten is uh, the uh, water expert and the head of the water program at Ceres. Ceres is an NGO that focuses on working with capital markets to uh, drive change uh, in terms of sustainability. And um, you may know Ceres because they're one of the co-founders of Climate Action 100 Plus. Uh, which is an investor, uh, which is an investor group or investor initiative uh, of, of, I think at the moment uh, it's over five, seven hundred uh, investors. And how much in terms of uh, of capital? You should, you need to take your mic. You need to take your mic. Yeah, uh, I let me let me check. I had it down here. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, yeah. We'll. we'll 700 investors plus, exactly, whoops. So, um, in any case, who, who advocate for uh, the largest polluters of carbon uh, to change and to improve what they're doing. And Kirsten leads that program and is established in that program for water. So, um, to, to take the 74 most important polluters of water um, and to have investor pressure on them, and that is something that's just started. Uh, Martin, uh, as marie said, is at UBS, uh, the ESG specialist for UBS, and so they manages the water strategy of, uh, of PICTE, which is uh, one of our largest and uh, longest standing funds. Now, um, the way that I'd like to uh, run this panel is to, you know, first ask some questions myself, but certainly, you know, you are going to have your chance as well. Now, if you're in the room, then uh, you can just press the little button um, and, uh, and ask your question uh, through the microphone there. But uh, if you are watching online, then there's a little box that you can type uh, a question in. And uh, here we go. If you are too shy to ask a question in the room, you can also scan this code and type something into your phone. But I assume most of you uh, won't want to do that. Um, now, let's start uh, first to talk about water risk um, in the financial sector. Uh, and how the financial sector is addressing water risk. And then in the second phase, I'd like to talk about opportunities. But first, let's talk about risk. So, and let's start with you, Samuel. I mean, you are, you're on the ground. You are more or less ground zero, um, seeing the water crisis firsthand in, in Africa. Um, so tell us a little bit, what are you seeing on the ground and how especially has that changed since you were first uh, in Uganda over 30 years ago drilling wells? Let's see, just try. There we go. Yeah. Many thanks. So many thanks for inviting me. Um, I feel a little bit like I'm in the wrong room as a civil engineer, but I will do my best uh, to talk about um, projects. Um, you know, my work has involved over the last 30 years designing and implementing pipelines uh, of bankable projects um, for delivery of water services in Africa. Um, so yes, indeed, I'm very much at the sort of uh, the coalface, if you like, of water supply provision. I'm based in, in Nairobi, but I've been based in many countries uh, in Africa, delivering water projects over the years. I just wanted to start by answering the question by talking about the known knowns, um, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns, because I think it's important to kind of set out what I understand are the main issues. So. The known knowns for me are that more than 400 million people lack access to water around the world. Um, many of them are like Zoe, their children, um, and obviously representing UNICEF, they are our biggest constituents. The second known is that the UN High Level Panel on Water um, basically estimates that we need about $114 billion annually for the CAPEX and about $120 million, uh, billion um, annually for the OPEX of which one third of that is financing for Africa. So whatever discussion we're having today when it comes to water clearly needs to have Africa and African children at the heart of the discussion. Some of the known unknowns are that in the past, um, concessional financing, particularly during the MDG period, was, was misdirected. 
Uh, it was directed towards areas which were where there was the highest willingness and capacity to pay. And secondly, much of the approach that was taken um, was really looking at a portfolio approach. So it was trying to offset one finance against the other. So then finally on the unknown unknowns, I think one of the unknown unknowns is how willing is this room to invest in these kind of projects. And I would challenge us in the period of the next hour to really try to look at what does bankability mean for a community that has been left behind under SDG 6. And I have examples uh, from the work that I've designed over the years, which I think could be very useful for the audience today as we look at that. Thank you. So, so in your view, there is a chance for bankability for these projects. I think that's always the challenge that we have, and we'll cover that a little bit later on, but um, often we're in the, uh, the developed world and we find it tough to finance those projects. So we'll cover that a little bit later on as we, as we go through. Now, Kristen, uh, at Ceres, as I said earlier, you work with financial firms uh, who want to bring about change. Um, but do you think that investors in the financial industry in general see the risks coming from the water crisis? Because I think uh, as, you know, we've been, we've been extremely focused on environment, we've been very focused on carbon. Uh, no, you know, no surprise that Carbon Action 100 Plus has existed for quite some time and water action has not. So are the risks known? Are, are people really aware? Or is this a bit, as Marie-Laure was starting at the beginning, just we need to shake people up first a bit? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and we think a lot about that every day of how we can really elevate water risk to the level of climate risk. Um, and, you know, I think as Marie Lohr mentioned, you know, it's been sprinkled about the last two days of discussion, but, um, you know, this is really the first opportunity to, to dive in. So, you know, I like to, to think um, of the glass half full, and, you know, we have definitely seen some positive trends that are very noteworthy and in terms of financial institutions, investors, and the private sector starting to really recognize um, and acknowledge water risk and then importantly act on it. Um, so a couple trends um, to really demonstrate this point, uh, Series back in 2015 launched um, a peer practice group called the Investor Water Hub, which was a working group our, of our investor network. Um, it started out in, in 2015 with you know, a dozen or so um, investors engaged and really, um, you know, learning from one another about how to evaluate water risk and, you know, financial decision making um, and how to act on that as well. Um, and then fast forward, um, you know, five, six years later, um, that's grown to 150 um, members representing, you know, 40 trillion in assets under management. So definitely a, a good trend. Um, we'll be talking more about this um, a little bit later on in the conversation, but uh, really another, another good data point to this end. About a month ago, uh, Ceres and our partners launched the Valley Water Finance Initiative, uh, which is a global investor-led engagement initiative. We'll get into the details of that a little bit later. But um, it launched with 64 investor signatories representing nearly 10 trillion in assets under management. It continues to grow. So some positive signs there. Um, but, you know, we're not at the, the 700 plus number that you uh, noted earlier, Hubertus, for, for investors engaging on Climate Action 100 plus. Of course, this isn't a competition, but, you know, something we can, we can strive for is getting more to the table on these issues. Can you describe a bit, because I, I mean, it's a very, very different world if you're, uh, you know, where, uh, where Samuel is, where you, you know, where the risks are tangible, they're very real. Um, it's, it's basically children not getting water. What are the risks for investors? Um, I mean, inevitably, it would seem very clear that long term there will be an impact uh, on, uh, you know, on, on the assets they're investing in. But can you be more tangible and describe a bit what you're seeing there? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, I think you really only have to pick up a, a newspaper uh, any day of the week to really see the water risk playing out. In fact, this morning I opened up my uh, app for the Los Angeles Times, and one of the lead stories is that we're in the midst of three-year record-breaking drought. And, um, you know, California, we serve uh, three-quarters of the fruits and nuts to our entire nation. Um, so you can just play this out in your head, um, you know, the physical risks of having too little water. Um, probably uh, it's made the headlines in Europe, I'm sure, the, the Colorado River situation that we're in right now. Um, the Colorado River serves, uh, you know, over 40 million people, billions of dollars of agriculture 
again, um, were in dire circumstances, needing to really go to, um, you know, they're forecasting a po possible dead pool situation that they're calling where the water will no longer flow, um, you know, over the dam. So really critical um, situation where we're seeing those physical risks of too little water or, you know, in the, in the case of Florida, you know, too much water and, and floods that are, um, you know, overwhelming infrastructure systems, for example. Um, you know, we also see, um, you know, the impacts from regulatory and um, potential reputational risk that are playing out. Um, you know, in the headlines this year, Monterey, Mexico, where they're facing, you know, major shortages and it's pitting industry, um, which is mainly operating at business as usual, against the community. Um, you know, those risks are re real. Um, year prior, we saw a large stranded asset from a brewery in Mexico that could no longer um, proceed as planned because uh, they didn't take into consideration the community water concerns. So we're seeing, you know, these issues play out in, in real time um, all around the globe. And, and Cedric, as an investor, including in valuations already, I mean, you obviously, as, you know, as, as the manager of the water fund, you, you look at the good side, you look at the opportunities on the water uh, front, but, you know, are you seeing, when you look beyond that universe, uh, already an impact in terms of valuations? Yeah, you're right. We look at it from the opportunity side, right? So I think, I mean, that's my area of expertise, really, which is looking at this from the companies that tackle global water challenges and, um, and, and how they're doing operationally and on, kind of on the stock market. You know, so maybe that's what I'm best equipped to talk about. And I think there, um, if you look at those companies that tackle these global water challenges, we, I mean, we regroup them into like, utilities, technology companies that offer, you know, the pumps, pipes, and valves for the networks that we need to, to, to service um, uh, water and wastewater um, utilities, as well as the environmental service companies. Those companies are actually, you know, the ones that, that are picking up these challenges are doing quite well. Um, so they, they're growing, you know, we, on the sales terms, we think that that market, you know, grows 2x GDP. Um, and, and I think it's poised for inflection, I think, as you've heard, here, it, it's, it's an accelerating environment, right? I think whether it's the regulation, whether it's um, the investments we need to mitigate climate change, um, whether it's you know, just the needs for new population to have access to water or wastewater services, there's, there's a lot of growth coming. Um, and then maybe in terms of what that looks like on the stock market, actually those subset of companies, the way that we define them and the way I think other water funds also define them, have outperformed global markets. So probably you can say that's, you know, you've been, you've, investors have gotten an excess return from, you know, investing in companies that tackle global water issues. So from the, oppor from the opportunity side, which we'll, as, as we'll, which we'll cover a bit more later on, it's very, very clear. But I would imagine there's also a risk component. And I mean, Martin, you, you cover uh, environmental, social, uh, and governance risk for UBS. At least you set the standards, you set the trends with your team. How are you talking to you know, the investors ac uh, across UBS in terms of uh, the topic of water? Um, are you, is, is there a specific guidance you're starting to give them in terms of how they, how they need to think about this in terms of risk as they're looking at, uh, at assets that they may invest in? Um, yeah, absolutely. This is a topic that is very much on our uh, radar screen, of course. Um, we typically uh, distinguish a bit between the financing and lending side and, and, and the investment side, right? On the financing and lending side, we will look at, at minimum standards. So if we um, finance a, a hydropower plant, then we want to make sure uh, that the companies uh, adhere to hydropower sustainability uh, assessment protocol, that they uh, use these standards. We want to see proof. We want to uh, verify uh, that, that that is actually all uh, not uh, further enhancing the credit risk, right? Um, um, if we look at, on the investment side, um, if you think about the, the, the public uh, side, it's obviously part of our uh, env environmental management uh, assessment uh, that we do. Um, I do think that it's, 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 it's somewhere behind, right, in, in terms of, of, of where climate uh, stands. I think all of our uh, analysts, I would claim, uh, at least at, 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 at UBS Asset Management, understand what a carbon footprint is, could tell you how that is calculated, can work with, with metrics, 
like forward-looking uh, uh, alignment. Um, on water, uh, we're, we're dealing with, with very simple topics, right? How do we compare uh, the water use of utilities uh, in a uh, overall global uh, universe? What, what are the right metrics? Uh, to what extent do you uh, include? Re those, those are topics that, that, that seem like, like five, ten years ago on, on the climate side that, that, that haven't been, been worked and has developed on, on uh, water, which we are uh, addressing now. So, so uh, we are making progress there. Uh, to come back to your question, because I think that, that's a very interesting one, is it uh, part of, of, of evaluation? And if we look at the uh, especially non-listed side, right? Uh, UBS has a very large real estate uh, portfolio. And there, um, we see that it's a, a direct uh, part of, of, of the attractiveness of a, a certain project that we finance or a building that we finance, right? It, it will impact the uh, overall end value of uh, the project, of the real estate. It will impact the uh, rents that, that the tenants are willing to, to, to pay. Uh, there might even be an effect of, of certain uh, tenants not even wanting to move into uh, a, a, a building that, that doesn't uh, adhere to the highest uh, standards. We are one of the largest farmland investors in the U.S., and, and there it's even clearer, right? <laughs> the, the, the discussions we just uh, had, if these farmlands don't have access to clean water anymore, um, they will not be as valuable for us as they uh, are at this point in time. So that is a key concern for us to make sure that we uh, assess uh, how the long-term sustainability provision of, of water is in these, these area. And we definitely take that uh, into account when we uh, value uh, a property or, or, or a piece of land. But it's interesting, and I, and I remember this, it is a, there is a, there's a bit of a difference between when you're lending Right where you have where you have really you know the bank is directly uh, going in and uh, and actually you know taking taking a significant uh, risk of its own versus um, when you're investing uh, for a client. Um, do you think that that process is um, is is right where it should be yet? I mean, there's definitely challenges in, in any financial institution. Um, what are you doing with 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 your part of the organization to move that forward? That maybe also some other. Um, you know, uh, financial firms could learn from because I think you have a, a quite forward-looking approach in terms of, of, of pushing um, for a, for a standard. You know, at at, at, at firms like Picte or Lombardier that that don't lend as much and certainly don't lend uh, commercially, it's a different ballgame. But uh, how do you how do you drive that? Yeah, I think that that's one of the the, the uh, big steps that we have taken. Right, this used to be uh, quite separate worlds, to be uh, fair and honest. Uh, so uh, we have uh, lending through our, our investment bank, uh, and and again that that focuses very much on the risk that is inherent. Uh, of these these environmental uh, topics to uh, the credit position that we uh, take. Um, what we have done now is, is uh, further align uh, the metrics that we use, the data that we uh, use, the uh, methodologies and frameworks across uh, lending and financing and uh, the investment side. In the end, we are looking at the same thing, and, and, and you might look at it from a different angle. The same number might mean something uh, different in a uh, financing context as it does in an investment context, but it's still that number and you can start to compare that number, you can start to track that and uh, a lot of the research that we do in that sense can then be leveraged uh, across a broader uh, uh, area of, of activities that we do and that, that's one of the, our key goals is to provide a, a um, ecosystem, as we call it, where uh, our clients, but also our uh, employees and analysts, have a, a framework where they can say, okay, I understand where this comes from. This is the same thing as I've seen on the other side. And we want to uh, further uh, drive that. Yeah. Very good. Now, Kristen, we talked about this earlier, and I'd like to give you the floor to kind of explain a little bit more the initiative that you lead uh, at Ceres. Um, I mean, you've, you've identified, as you said earlier, uh, 72 heavy, heavy corporate water users and polluters. So in a way, you know, the worst 72 actors. Uh, and so far, you have uh, at least 64, at least at last looking, 64 financial firms representing about 10 trillion in assets uh, who have signed up 
to change with how these companies move forward, to, to actually put pressure on these companies to say, look, we'll keep investing, but you need to change. And here's some things that you can do. Um, describe to us a little bit more specifically what is the initiative asking them to do and, and, and how are you moving it forward? And especially, what are your ambitions with it? Where do you want to get to? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, first taking a step back to link to your first question of, you know, are investors really starting to think about and act on water risk? And so a few years back, we really sort of tried to unpack this question and really reflecting a lot on the work that we're doing in the climate space at Ceres, you know, how can we get more investors to the table to really ensure that we're addressing, you know, the scope and scale of the water crisis um, that we're facing that's at our doorstep as we speak. And so really in unpacking that, we realized that we needed to develop some foundational work first um, on, on the water side of the house. And so we convened a group of 14 pension funds from around the world to provide us insights um, and really uh, show leadership on this issue. Um, we brought together uh, academics um, from the Global Institute of Water Security and about a dozen other academic institutions to help us uh, really build the scientific case a lot of the investor partners were saying it's really crucial that this is founded in science. We agreed. Um, we needed to really bring the science together and ar articulate it in a way that resonated with the financial uh, community in terms of um, industry impacts to water resources. Um, the other element is that we really needed to uh, continue to build out the business case and compel investors um, to join us at the table. Um, and then the, the final piece of the puzzle was really developing a framework of action steps that investors can use in engagements um, with companies. And so that gets to your question. So um, about a month ago, we um, had all this foundational work in place. Um, and so we were ready to actually launch the Valley Water Finance Initiative, um, which as we've mentioned is a global investor led initiative to engage companies with uh, very large water footprints on how they're valuing water and how they're acting on it. Um, and so, as, as you mentioned, um, you know, we're working currently with 64 investor signatories. We've identified uh, 72 companies um, that are in high impact sectors that were identified within that scientific research that I mentioned. So again, really drawing from the science. Um, and so the framework that investors will be uh, working from as they engage companies uh, consists of six main components around water quantity, water quality, access to sanitation and water, um, also governance, ecosystem health, and then public policy engagement. So, um, you know, the investors that we've consulted and many NGO stakeholders have coalesced around these six action steps um, that we'll be working to as we engage with companies and actually start to see that change on the ground. And I will note, you know, of those 74 companies that we've targeted, they, they have that high water footprint um, and, you know, but there are different places in their journey. So, you know, we'll be really looking to meet that, them where they are and hopefully lift all boats um, with this work. Uh, now, Cedric, again, you know, really more specifically from, a, from, a, from an investor or, or, or PICTE point of view, um, I know PICTE engages, you know, quite heavily on a number of different topics now. Um, you won't necessarily be engaging on the topic of water because you are, you know, investing in companies that are that are, you know, providing solutions. But do you work with your colleagues who are managing other strategies at Big Day uh, in terms of helping them to talk to some of those 72 com companies that we might be investing in already uh, today to say, look, uh, based on my expertise as a water expert, uh, and of course also potentially based on some of the work that the Kirsten team have done. Here's what you could be asking uh, these companies to do um, to, to improve their footprint uh, and also as in to remain, uh, you know, investable and positive going forward. Yeah. Well, first of all, I say I'm a big fan of, of what Sarah does and probably I'll outline why now, right? But maybe if I put back my the big day water strategy manager hat on for a second, right? I think over 20 years we've learned a lot about, you know, investing in, in companies that 
help save water and recycle water at semiconductor manufacturers, at food and beverage manufacturers. And so we've got a little bit, quite a bit of subject matter expertise accumulated. And we have quite a lot of resources. We have an advisory board that's dedicated uh, on water issues. And so we engage water companies on you know, a whole host of ESG issues that can be water related or not. But now if I put back my, my Pite Group hat on here, we're also trying to use that expertise, that subject matter expertise, those resources that we have, you know, to potentially engage group holdings where there is a water issue. So it's precise, precisely what you're describing. Um, and there we have some examples indeed where you know, some of our clean energy colleagues who, who run a, a, an investment strategy based on, an, on the energy transition, they have holdings in semiconductor companies and us having been shareholders of the companies that provide the water recycling equipment, well, we, we, can, we can help them along in, in that journey. So, yes, definitely, um, but maybe if I just add another dimension to it, because I think the subject matter expertise is, is, is not enough, basically. I think you also need, um, you need a receptive audience and you need critical mass. And I think that's where probably Ceres can be so effective, because for the water strategy, we are long-term shareholders, and we've been there 20 years, so they listen to us. Mm. But if you're a small asset investor, then, then maybe you don't get that breadth uh, and, and, mm. that, and, 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 the, and the seat at the table. Well, I guess you would table. argue the, the audience becomes receptive if you have critical mass, right? Exactly. Uh, that, I guess, is, is, is precisely the way that the that series is tackling this. Uh, Martin, now, it, I want to ask you a similar question, actually. Uh, how, how does... Uh, how does UBS engage on water risk? I know you are very focused on climate and you're very focused on inclusive growth and I'm a very big fan of focus because I think if, you, you know, if you're not, you're gonna spread yourself incredibly thin. But nevertheless, what do you do on that topic and is what Kristen outlined actually something interesting for you to consider? Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, when we look at, at, at engaging with uh, companies on climate actually, and it's, it's, it's interesting to see because a lot of the large or the carbon intensive companies actually also have quite a high uh, water use. So this is something that, that often is, is brought in tandem uh, to the attention uh, how we uh, think they can, can uh, deal with that. Um, what we don't have on, on water, what we do have on, on carbon is specific thematic uh, engagement. So uh, where we are part of the Climate 100 uh, Action um, Coalition and, and, and where we have uh, specific expertise where we think we can help uh, the companies uh, on a trajectory how to reduce their carbon emissions. We wouldn't offer that kind of depth on the uh, water uh, side. As said, uh, we, we need to make uh, choices. We can't be uh, the, 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 the counterpart for, for, for all SDGs for uh, all companies. So, so um, that's a deliberate choice that we uh, made. Um, that said, I think that will... Um, uh, change going forward, right? We've uh, just heard uh, Marilo talk about the um, TNFD. Uh, this is a, a, a topic where uh, standardization of that uh, disclosure will be uh, a key role. Um, but uh, as I always uh, say about the TCFD, it's not about the disclosure. Forget about what, what, what the number said. It's about the actions that the companies take to create the disclosures that the uh, um, sort of investors uh, want to see. And that's exactly where we also um, uh, think we can uh, play an important role. We are a large investor in, in many uh, uh, companies. Um, I think we are uh, listened to, uh, and in that perspective, we can also set standards, um, ask for uh, targets similar as we, we do in, in climate, ask for uh, plans, how they're gonna reach uh, these targets. So, so that is how we address the topic uh, now, not as much uh, in, in, in front and center as, as the climate uh, topic, but definitely something that is very strong on our mind. Perfect. Thank you very much. Now, you will have noticed that uh, I actually have not had a chance to come back to Samuel for, for quite some time because uh, most of the topics, Samuel, that we've been talking about involve, you know, big companies, 
um, 72 big companies in particular that are, that, are, that are big polluters. Most of them, I believe, Kirsten, in the developed world, I would imagine, with their, with their operations also mostly in, in the developed world. So um, two questions. Does, does engaging with them, asking them to change, um, make much difference for the 21 countries in Africa that uh, your team work with? And, and how else do you think uh, you know, the financial sector can make you know, a positive difference, particularly for the problems that you were outlining earlier uh, in that area of the world? Yeah, I mean, first of all, say it's really interesting to hear all these different perspectives. Um, I mean, for me, the fact that 10% of the, you know, the world's water resources are in Africa, but 20% of the world's population is in Africa. And as was mentioned by Mary Laura in the, you know, the initial statement, the biggest risk that water poses to the world is security. That's the biggest risk. When we look at all the process of migration, displacement, we look at conflict around the world, it's all related directly to water. There's not one war that you could point to at the moment in the world that's not somehow linked with water. Even the Ukraine crisis, we look at the food export that's going on, it's all related to the management of water. So as far as I look at it, yeah, what could these big companies do? How could they support us? I think the biggest challenge that we're facing at the moment, and I'm talking about people knocking on my door in Nairobi who are investors. The biggest challenge we face is that we don't have a pipeline of bankable projects to offer to these big companies. We don't have. Now, I've developed a number myself for my team, but maybe they're not big enough for what they need. So what I think we need in support is exactly what are the criteria of risk that these investors would want us to put in these bankable projects so we can deliver them on the ground for these specific communities. Now, when I'm talking about communities, I'm not talking, I'm not talking about remote rural villages. I'm talking about the fact that Africa is the most quickest urbanizing continent in the world. We are seeing an exponential growth in urban areas. Some of the populations, we look at some of the cities, have grown four times in the 30 years that I've been working in the continent. So if we really want to invest in water infrastructure, we need to be investing in those cities. That's how I see this. And I think some of the learnings you've said from, from the US could be very useful for us in the work that we do uh, in Africa. So that would be essentially what I would say for, for the response. And I, if I could, I would, I would challenge the, the colleagues here because it's very comfortable, this discussion, right? It's very nice and everyone's nodding and it's all, it's all good. But a lot of what you're saying, right, particularly our colleague here from the investment for, from the banking side, is all fine within the nice confines of the banking sector. Right? You've got good regulation, you've got good partnerships, you've got good things that work. The reality is that in the emerging markets, that's not the case. And where we need the support is we need the support to get those things in place so that your investments can work. And so some of the risks that you're identifying, to be honest, are not real risks for us. They are realities for us. And it would be very, very useful if in this conversation you could also think about those emerging markets and how those emerging markets could be addressed, particularly from a water risk perspective. Yeah, I think that's, that's in particular what this second part of this conversation is, is supposed to be about, but I think it's also definitely the biggest challenge. You know? And I think the, the first part, which is you know, putting pressure on companies that are not doing good things in terms of water is extremely important. It's something that the finance sector can do quite well already today. Um, but actually, you're absolutely right. Bringing opportunity to emerging markets, uh, one of our colleagues is sitting in the front row, uh, who actually manages emerging market investments for us. We may actually ask her to come up on stage later on and ask, <laughs> answer a few questions on what might be able to, what we could do in that topic, because it gets very much into, you know, also financing governments, which is which is not, you know, and, and, and government bonds, which is different than than companies. But Cedric, but you know, one specific question in this regard is, uh, you know, are there are there, at least in some emerging markets, water utilities that are listed that you find interesting, that could be opportunities, um, and uh, you know, that with your work can be reformed and improved? Yeah, I think, I, I think if I back up a second and, and maybe explain a little bit what our modus operandi and our mission is, no? so that maybe also you understand 
a little bit where we're coming from, right? I, I think we run a we run a mutual fund that that basically offers daily liquidity, right? So given our size, we cater towards um, towards our investors needing to, to to get money every day in and out of the fund. So what does that mean? That means that actually, when you run a large fund, um, you are going to be tilted towards uh, holdings that are in developed markets because there's more liquidity. So one of the points that you're addressing here is the lack of liquidity and developed stock market institutions and all the legal and national and, and regulatory elements that revolve around um, why developed markets have more liquidity and are you know, more available uh, companies to invest in. So part of it is, is that, that's probably the first thing. And it, um, if I come back to your question about developing market uh, utilities, certainly there's some that we've been uh, shareholders of for you know more than a decade. Sabespi is a, is a Brazilian utility. And there, I think, very excited, absolutely, in, in the potential, not so much on the drinking water side because the connections and the percentage penetration there is already quite high. But if you look at you know, wastewater, how much percentage of the population in Brazil is connected to, to wastewater, well, there, there you're really at a very low base, basically. And so every time these kind of companies raise capital, we are there as primary you know, providers of capital um, to help those new connections being made. No? And I think that's, that's part of the strategy's DNA for the last you know, 20 years, is to actually be a provider of capital to the utilities that, uh, that go that out and actually put, put money on the ground. That have that potential, but, but as we said, they have to be listed and, 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 it's a, and it's a complicated process. Kristen, there's been a lot of conversation in the last two or three or four years around this topic of blended finance, right? Partnerships between public and private um, development impact bonds is one is one uh, term that comes to mind where you know private investors can put risk capital and at the same time can get a reward if the project has uh, has a successful outcome at the end, often actually coming from from a government aid agency at the end. Um, what's your view at Series in terms of those types of vehicles to bring financing? to the types of uh, topics that, that Samuel was talking about. Uh, and, and actually in general in the opportunity section, you know, what are, what, are the, what are your views? Yeah, no, I mean, these risks that we've been talking about definitely also present many opportunities. So it's uh, important to have this conversation. And you know, we've heard a lot throughout the last two days about how blended finance really can be an approach to help move forward a lot of these projects. So I would agree on the water side, you know, that is the case. We can learn from these other areas of work where we've seen success and, and hopefully, um, you know, translate that to water-related investments. Um, you know, another point I'd like to raise that sort of links some of these dots, um, you know, I think um, I just returned from World Water Week in Stockholm where we hear, um, you know, from a lot of leaders in the space in the private sector and really, you know, what are the leaders, what is the cutting edge best practice um, to really mitigate their risks. And so, you know, of course, we're seeing a lot of the leaders in the space um, really understanding, you know, their entire footprint of their value chain and their supply chain, which really, you know, goes into many of those emerging markets if, if you trace, trace that back and really understand, um, you know, what is the extent of your supply chain and where are those, the footprint lies. Um, and so a lot of the leaders are starting to also think about how within, you know, the footprint of our entire operations and supply chain, can we really, um, reduce the risk because you can't necessarily reduce the risk if you're just within your own fence line because we know uh, what a watershed is like and we know that there's a lot of straws in every watershed um, and a lot of discharge points into every watershed and so you really need a watershed approach to a lot of these issues. Um, so what we're seeing a lot of the leading companies do is really identifying you know, really extensively where their footprint is and then look to others in that same watershed for collective action type projects. And so um, the Water Resilience Coalition, for example, is um, formed from the CEO water mandate. Um, and they're identifying you know, the top 100 priority basins of high water risk. And they're coalescing um, you know, projects 
um, that these companies and other stakeholders can coalesce around and hopefully implement um, you know, throughout the globe and really get that on the ground change. So you know, I really I see the, the through line here of this whole conversation that you know, there are many routes you can go to really get that on the ground imp impact and get those solutions in place. And, and Samuel, are you seeing any of that yet? I mean, you've, you've been there for 30 years. Do you see some progress in terms of uh, there being more finance and more engagement from, from financial firms down there? Or be honest, no, not yet. No, I think honest, yes. Uh, blended finance is something that we started talking about about 10 years ago in the water sector in Africa. And a lot of the financial institutions in Africa are doing it. Um, but it's still heavily reliant on grant aid to make it happen. And I think where investors could come in is particularly at the feasibility level to finance feasibility studies, finance pre-feasibility work so that we can develop the pipelines of projects. There's no reason why, or there's limited risk for an investor to do that, and there's no reason why we should be reliant on grant aid to do that component. It can be just as well done by the private sector and by investors. Now, the investor doesn't then have to come in and invest in the capex of the project. That could come from a different form of concessional finance. But I do think there's a huge role that could come from this audience in terms of supporting the work of developing those feasibility studies, those pipelines of projects, which will help us get to scale with blended finance. But, but why, why would a feasibility study be interesting for an investor? What is their return? Yeah, well, that's where, that's where the risk will be, right? But, I mean, you've got to accept here that in most of the countries we're working in, 50% of the population does not have access to water. And we don't have projects. So there's going to have to be a certain level of investment that needs to go in. Now, if you go into that investment with a feasibility lens, you can move into the capex, and then the capex, of course, there's a rate uh, of return of investment which will come from the tariff, which will come directly from the system once it's put in place. Yeah, but I, I, to be honest, to, to, to challenge a bit, there is no professional investor that says, okay, I'm just going to do a feasibility study and I'll, I'll see what comes from it, right? That's the whole uh, discussion uh, Philip Hildebrand brought up yesterday. Uh, investors, which are in the end are, are, are pensioners and, and, and people that, that feel they deserve uh, the highest return possible from, from their fiduciary manager, right, will say, okay, uh, I'll, I'll invest when I um, know that I, 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 I can get a report. And, and there I do think that there is a lot more possible than what is currently done. And I think we should challenge the financial sector, and we do that our, ourselves, in coming up with more innovative solutions to think about how can we use uh, philanthropic capital, uh, public money, uh, to provide first loss uh, um, uh, compensation and, 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 and change the risk return profile for uh, the sizable amounts of, of, of capital to come in. One other point that I uh, noticed, because this is a huge issue, um, we often, I get many requests, we have a fantastic project. The IIR looks uh, all great, everything is fantastic. The problem to get that going is the amount of contracts and, and, and uh, on the ground work that we need to do to get the financing going. And then it becomes so expensive that neither UBS nor our investors make any money of it. And, and, and that is, there is a, 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 a real problem in, in making sure that we get standardized contracts, that we have technology solutions that take away a large part of uh, the paperwork, the, the, the institutional uncertainty that we have in, in, in that system. And I think that, uh, again, is something that we need to work on. Uh, but currently, that, that is, for me, probably the biggest barrier that we see to, to actually support the projects that you're talking about. I, I hear your frustration with it's, it's fine to talk about uh, Unilever's uh, uh, loss of water and, and, and the risk that it has for the PL. Uh, but that's that's the real barrier. We we can't scale up currently so, so fast that, enough. So one concrete takeaway, Marie Laura, that you asked for would be: we have to find a way to standardize, more simplify uh, blended finance uh, solutions to actually make them a part of the system that uh, that is understandable by everyone. Because if you have that, you would massively reduce cost and complexity, and you know funding can go to the types of projects that. Uh, uh, that you, you know, 
definitely and rightfully say need, need some support. Now, I'm looking at the clock. We're, um, we've gone for about 45 minutes, um, and I do want to give the audience a chance to ask a few questions. So I'm going to ask maybe one or two more, uh, and then, uh, and I'm just prepping you for this, uh, it's your chance to ask your questions uh, here in the room, and there's also a few that have come in um, on, uh, online already. Um, but Cedric, I want, to, I want to bring the conversation back to you, and a little bit more maybe also on the, on the hopeful side, because you invest in innovation. You invest in the future of what could solve some of these problems uh, in the world. And, and of course, you know, as we always think that innovation will do everything, we know it won't, but um, do give us some of the you know, interesting ideas that you're seeing today that could make a big difference uh, in the future. Sure. So um, I get, I'm going to stick on the concept of, of, of industrial water now because I think, uh, and as has been highlighted by, by Kristen as well, I mean, there's huge savings. Corporations are huge users of water in their industrial processes, and, and ultimately, the that's what we see. Closer. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, corporations are huge water abstractors, and we see that as a as a as a major source of, of savings going forward. So, um, one company that we're invested in is called Evoqua. So, it's a U.S. small cap, and they basically help tackle the issues that we were talking about earlier, which is okay. So, semiconductor manufacturing is is incredibly water intense. Beer manufacturing is incredibly water intense. I mean, um, I think Heineken abstracts uh, 100 million cubic meters of water a year. And that's, you know, I think we're, we're in Switzerland, so that's half the size of the Emosson Dam, you know, which is on the other side of, of, of Lac Léman here. So they're huge users of water. Beer is a very water intensive industrial process. Um, now, these guys have committed to being water positive by 2035. So that means there's a hell of a lot of things that they're going to have to do um, in order to get there, but it's a combination of infrastructure and their own footprints and reducing, improving the recyclability of, of water in their footprints, um, and also a combination of nature-based solutions and, and, and restoring that at the, at the, at the, at the watershed level. Um, so do, you think like do you think there's a market for water offsets? So it's not, uh, that's a secondary issue and, and probably the biggest issue there in terms of, of Heineken's progress, right? But a company like Evoqua will provide the technology, the equipment, um, in order to make at least make their own operations water-free. So a lot, lot more efficient in terms of, well, now, now yeah. isn't And they can do that without chemicals, I mean, uh, depending on how much you're ready to put behind this, all right, yeah. in monetary terms. Now, now, now maybe, and maybe, to, to, to end us on, maybe two, two questions, one to you and then one to you. Isn't one way that you could engage with, with someone like Evoca to say, look, your technology is amazing, but it's not affordable in, in areas where, where he's active, um, but you know, it, would be, it would be one thing that you could do in, in, in addition to what you're doing already to you know, work with, um, with the UN, potentially, to, uh, you know, to bring some of these solutions to, to governments uh, uh, where they're needed most. With, with Heineken in this case, right? Because Heineken's on that path to 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 to, to water positive, and they have uh, you know these commitments. It's not been implemented in all of their of their of their breweries. Evidently, those were you know. I mean, there is I guess a, a question of the economics of water behind this, right? So, uh, engaging with Heineken here, and I'm sure that's probably something that you guys have on your yeah. So, absolutely, yep. And um, I mean, just to, maybe just to end on this before we turn to questions, Samuel, is that something that you would find interesting also from a UN's perspective, not just to be implementing projects locally, but to say, look, there are some amazing innovations. We have some amazing contacts. Um, can we not facilitate that, that these innovations are brought to, you know, to, to governments as ideas for things that they could implement locally with their utilities? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, governance is not easy, right? So, I mean, the point you raise about the, the lack of structures on the ground to implement projects, that's exactly what we do. We have to put in place PMUs to be able to do the procurements, to do the environmental and social safeguard oversights, to make sure projects get delivered, because governance is not easy, particularly not decentralized governance uh, in, in Africa. So when we talk about these kind of solutions like Heineken um, have come up with, and similar ones around the fact that the whole of the continent is surrounded by the sea, and there are massive desalination uh, solutions which are coming in, this is exactly where we need to build the bridge. Right? This is exactly where we need to see what's working with, with technologies that you're looking at investing in and how can we transfer them towards us. 
Uh, sea level rises is, 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 is a serious issue for many of the coastal cities in Africa. Many of the soils are becoming saline. The actual saline ingress in the groundwater is a serious issue. We need to invest in desal plants and we need to learn from these kind of experiences so that we can then put those projects on the ground. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, we've gone for a bit over uh, 45 minutes. And I want to turn uh, to the audience, actually, and ask you, if you have a question, please just you know, raise your hand or, or go ahead and push the button. There are a few here that I could draw from as well. But um, uh, I want to always give the audience a chance to go first. So is there anyone who would like to go first? Please. Uh, thank you very much. I've just come from a session uh, on the urgency uh, of inclusive growth strategies. <clears throat> and I've been actually quite disappointed to hear at the beginning of this session the uh, response that there aren't bankable projects. If we're serious about building bridges, surely we have to be finding ways to meet at the middle. And the question should rather be not you know, why aren't there bankable projects, but to say this is the project we need for integrated water resources management inclusively delivered globally, because you can't only do first world solutions and cherry pick. At some point, we have to find a mechanism to finance rural, uh, rural communities, urban slums, whatever it might be. Last two, questions, last two sentences. There are already examples of global funds where international NGOs who contribute hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars globally, have the infrastructure on the ground and can be contracted, hopefully not just as implementing partners, but as partners in the investment process because they mobilize the social capital. So those global funds are examples where an integrated water resources management, I've also worked for the Global Water Partnership, uh, would be a useful thing to do. The second thing is we are still pushing industrialised solutions to water when there are nature-based solutions using biostimulants that are proven in first world economies and yet we still go in with tubes and pipes. So I'm actually suggesting that in this group, which really has the potential to turn the ship around, we need to be thinking outside this box. It's not just about what's bankable for the banks. Sorry. No, no, that's very clear. But I think the, uh, the, the challenge with that is, um, you know, in, in the end, the banks have a responsibility to certain investors. And yes, and so that somehow, yes, I know. And you can, you can sing that song, but in the end, we do. So it has to somehow be bankable. But I think that's the whole point. We have to try to find what the solution is. And, and you and said that yourself, and I appreciate exactly. that. Yeah. Under current regulatory environments, it's too easy to say, oh, but we can't do that. No, I totally We agree. have to find a new solution. Exactly. Thank you. So, but I mean, if, um, if it were easy, we would know it. Um, and I think that's, that's uh, probably our challenge. But um, I mean, any, any reaction from anyone on the panel to, the, to, that, to that comment? I think you're absolutely right. There is a lot of philanthropic capital um, and, and philanthropic organizations who are active on the ground who could be used by um, by firms, by banks, to say, look, uh, you already have a solution on the ground, you're working on something, is there not a way that we can make this investable? And I think that's a conversation to be had, for sure. Maybe, maybe I can give one example. So um, UBS has its own foundation, uh, the Optimus Foundation. It's a um, um, uh, fantastic organization, I think, who does a lot of good work. And we developed the context or the uh, setup of a, a SDG outcome uh, fund. So we target uh, especially um, education in that, that product and we uh, focus on setting up projects with philanthropic uh, uh, capital and then uh, bringing in uh, 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 commercial capital to, to, to uh, fund that. The total size of that fund is 200 million and it might sound like a very big amount, right? Uh, uh, but in the greater context of, of, of UBS in terms of the assets that we manage. This is, this, is, this is small scale. And even the pension funds that we talk to and say, okay, isn't this a fantastic opportunity? We now give you IRR, we give you uh, a fantastic project, and uh, you can even uh, talk to your uh, participants about uh, the schools that you have uh, developed. 
uh, and they say, yeah, but um, if we need to allocate somebody for uh, 20 million to look after this, this investment, that doesn't work for us. Come back when you have a, a, a billion or a billion and a half. And that, that uh, again, that is, the, <laughs> that is the real problem that we uh, face. And I'm not saying that, that we can just walk away from it and, and, and we don't have a responsibility. We need to think about creative solution. We need to think about standardization. We need to think about, um, um, but, but it's, um, it is not always uh, uh, the, 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 the bank's uh, fault that, that it doesn't materialize, right? It, 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 we simply can't use uh, the, 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 the capital and, and the investments of our, our clients as, as, as money for funding uh, elements that we would like to see and we would love to see developed through uh, philanthropic uh, capital, but it, it, it is not, right? So, so there we need to strike this balance and find this, 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 this um, in the end, win-win for, for both parties. By the way, um, so if I actually had left one seat open, if Marie-Laure, if you want to actually join us for the Q&A, you did speak at the beginning, so um, please come on up um, and, uh, and join us, and, and you're going to have to share mics with, with Cedric. But uh, are there other questions uh, from the audience? And thank you for that first one. I appreciate it. Maybe I just would rebound on that question, because you, Hubert, as a moderator, but again, I think within PT, you you have a role uh, managing the foundation no i'm so i'm sure you you have a, you have a view on you know how capital with a maybe maybe a more patient and more long term outlook can from an, even from a philanthropic sense to participate in some of these projects yeah i think i mean but i think that's the quote unquote easy way right i mean our foundation the pick day group foundation focuses on water and nutrition so you know, we are giving philanthropic capital uh, uh, in, in, in not insignificant amounts to water projects in precisely the areas where he's active. But I don't, based on everything that I know and that I've heard and based on the scale of the problem, um, that's not enough. So we have to find a way uh, to, you know, to make these projects somehow more investable. Blended finance, I think, you know, again, uh, you know, I, I, I know quite well the work of the Optimus Foundation uh, at UBS is, is a potential, I think has a lot of potential, but it is mega expensive and it's mega complicated. Uh, and so if you can standardize it, it is one way of bringing capital down there. And then, you know, you, you have to, in some way, you know, I think there is a way for, and you, you're seeing a lot more of, of, um, of philanthropic support for social entrepreneurs, for people who actually want to not just you know, do, do good and, and expect to be funded from, from some philanthropy, but who said, no, I want to make a business out of this. And I think that is uh, you know, supporting those types of, uh, of, uh, of activities with philanthropic funding now to help them scale and to help them come to a, a you know, commercial viability so that at some point in time, Cedric's fund can invest in them is again one way to do it. But you know, it's, uh, it's, it's easy to say, and for that, we need you know, some of the bigger organizations, um, including organizations like Ceres or, or the UN, to say, look, come, sit down, and not just talk about it here, but actually work on it. Work on it for a day or two where there's no audience, um, and, and really think about what can the solutions be. Yeah, to, uh, just to come in, I mean, it's important for us not to think that this is just all about doing good, right? You know, what the water is an industry. I'm a civil engineer. I didn't train to do good. I trained to deliver water, right? So water is an industry. We are professionals, and we want to deliver water services. Now, the challenge we have is that we cannot get the investments in the areas where they're needed. That's the basic issue. So let me give you an example of a project that we've developed which could help in this discussion. So about eight years ago, we had a massive refugee influx from South Sudan into Ethiopia. 300,000 refugees came across the border into Ethiopia, and they were all settled in camps. The immediate response for the water was humanitarian response, truck water, give the water to the people. We as UNICEF at the time, and I'm not trying to market UNICEF, but I work for them, what we did was we developed a bankable project, $20 million of investment, pumps, pipes, move the water from the river to the camp, and we set up a water utility at the time which we twinned with a utility from Leipzig in Germany. And we provided water to the refugee camp through a bulk meter. The bulk meter 
paid essentially the funds to the utility for that utility to work. Roll forward eight years, we've expanded this project now. We've got a pipeline of projects in Somalia, in Sudan, in Kenya, in Uganda. 200 million euros of investment. We've done all the feasibility work. We've got the PMU. We're making the investments. What we now need to do is crowd in additional finance into that facility. So this is where the opportunities are. We're not starting from scratch. We have projects, but it's a matter of getting this audience to start investing in those projects. And, and how can those projects be more visible for this audience? Because that may be one of the topics. Absolutely. Well, thanks to the Swiss NatCom of UNICEF for inviting me and for you to invite me today. Because it was a long trip from Nairobi, but at least I think I've got my message across to the audience. Right? I mean, that's the visibility, right? Because if I wasn't here telling you today, it's unlikely you'll be reading the blogs and listening to the podcast that I do. So the fact that you invite me into the room helps with that visibility. What we would like to do as an outcome, a practical outcome of this, is really just join hands, build those bridges, and start investing in these types of projects for water, because this is going to be the future, we think, for the water sector in Africa. It's, it's almost too good of a point not to end on, but I, we have a little bit more time, and I do want um, you know, to look around in the audience, because we have one more question there, and I do want to take one or two uh, from uh, who, have, who have come in online, but Kirsten, you had a, a point you wanted to Yeah, I just wanted to highlight again, you know, I think this discussion and, and these projects that you all are discussing you know, will be complemented by what the private sector needs to do on its journey to be net zero water, and so you know, as we look at you know, deep into supply chains and, and and what the private sector is going to need to do to meet these lofty goals that many of them are setting and others will hopefully set once we, um, you know, the investors in Valley and Water engage with them, um, you know, that will provide another um, suite of important projects um, to complement this work. I think the other piece is also the public policy engagement and the government governance engagement conversations. And that is something that the Valley and Water Finance Initiative is really highlighting, that we need the financial sector, we need the private sector to be part of those conversations because we need all the tools in the toolbox and um, you know, really get some of those regulatory frameworks and public policy frameworks helping advance all the work that we're talking about. Please. If you, could, if you could just use one of those mics, just... Okay, please, and then I'll repeat the question for people who are online. That's fine. Okay, so in summer, there will be like the... It's okay. So, this summer, there have been the worst drought in the last 5,000... Uh, sorry, 500 years. And on the other end, the infrastructure, also in Europe, is super old, and there is a lot of leakage. I mean, I come from Italy, where on average, 40% of the water is totally wasted. So I was wondering, can the, banking in, can the banking sector help in this direction? And uh, can uh, this be interesting for investors? Cedric? Yeah, um, absolutely. Listen, um, non-revenue water, so that's the, what you're referring to, right? Which is water gets pumped into a utility and just leaks all over the place because the pumps are, the, the pipes are, 200, 400 years old, um, and, and so it's, it's a fantastic subject for engagement. We use it um, in order to speak to our utilities. Um, the regulator often incentivizes the utilities on, on non-revenue water and reducing that, um, but it's a, it's a big issue, and somehow I, I think there, there's an economic amount which it makes no sense to go under in the sense that you know 10%, depending on the utility footprint itself, um, you can you have a certain amount of non-revenue water in developed markets, which is which, which is acceptable. But when it gets to 40, London is at 25. You're 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 obviously throwing throwing money and water down the drain, literally. Um, there's technologies that also enable us to do better with that now. So like Xylem and is a, is a, is a company um, that has a, a, a subsidiary census metering that basically does a digital modeling of, of, of the water utilities infrastructure and by and basically improves the pressure management so that you you a can detect a leak and b put less through the areas that 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 that, that are losing the most so for sure that's an area that we speak to with with uh, with the utilities that we invest in in order to improve it beyond what the regulator is actually suggesting 
on, on that point, and I'll come to the, I think we had one other question uh, that was there a second ago, but on that point, we had a question that came in earlier, Cedric, that I'd be interested in that, in that same context, um, whether a politically set higher price for water, um, at least here in the Western world, uh, or the developed world, would make sense to A, for people to value it more, and B, uh, including, you know, eliminating leakages more quickly, uh, and B, to potentially also finance projects in, uh, in underdeveloped or uh, uh, emerging markets. Yeah, so great point. Um, and again, sorry, this is again with regards to mostly uh, developed world, but I think it also applies to the developing world, which is this concept of full cost pricing. Basically, we're not there um, for different reasons. And uh, you know, if you ask me, I think it's mostly governance related. But um, full cost pricing would mean uh, a covering the cost of the utilities at one point. It doesn't need to be the end consumer that pays. You know, we can subsidize those that need, need the, that, that those, those help with those bills. But at least these utilities should be operated correctly. Like, and, and, and so I think tiered pricing is part, of, is part of one of those tarification outcomes that I think would be incredibly beneficial both for preservation of, of, of the water that, that we're putting through these utilities. I mean, you mentioned it earlier, utilities are carbon intensive. You put water is 50, I mean, depending where, at least 50% energy. So it's carbon intensive. Um, if you can preserve water, reduce the amount that's going through the pipes, that's A, you're gaining on non-revenue water, but you're gaining on, on carbon and, and, and all sorts of other elements. So disincentivizing you know, extremely important uses of water for swim filling up swimming pools, I think should absolutely be part of any global utilities mandate. Mm. Can I, can I add one thing? I, I was in fixed income and, and a lot of these water utilities are high yield and, and uh, the portfolio manager always used to say water is such a fantastic topic because you couldn't run the company into the ground even if you wanted it. The management can be as bad as they want. Society is going to want their water and they're going to pay for it so I'm fine with my debt. The problem is that's only true probably in the developed world where that money can be uh, uh, put together and where, where the value of that contract is, is, is high enough to make sure that it, that it actually happens. And I think that's, that's exactly where, where we uh, lack. So uh, in the end it might, might be uh, a governance where it doesn't help us anything, but um, this, this, this pricing and, and the value of water and water being such a crucial necessity for life in general, um, there must be smarter ways than we're currently addressing that in the financial world. Very good. I will give the floor to all of you for one last question, if there still is one. You had one? No? Please, yes. It was touched upon. Okay, then, then in the back behind you, please, go ahead. So maybe, so maybe this question goes to Cedric, I guess. Um, we learned in the introduction, actually, that even in Switzerland now, we have problems with water, uh, which worries me because I was born and raised and I always knew that with water, everything is safe in Switzerland. Do you also engage with Swiss companies when it comes to your fund? Do I engage with Swiss companies? Right, that was your question. Um, so... As an investor only in, in the kind of the companies, the solution providers, right? There's actually not many Swiss water companies. We consider um, Giberit to be part of our investment universe because effectively they're allowing for their products enable lower consumption of water at home, right? Through like efficient shower heads and efficient faucets and water efficient faucets. Um, we haven't had to engage Giberit <laughs> ever. Uh, because we find they do a fantastic job uh, on an all-round basis in terms of, you know, the products that they that they that they produce, they w the way that they their environmental footprint. Uh, we, we've been quite happy with them um, in their operations. So I don't have one in the, at least in the four years that I've been managing the strategy, there hasn't been. Yeah. There's probably standard. other investors at at Big Day who would, um, you know, who might be. Invested in a, in a in a utility here, if there is uh, is one that you know, where they could where you could uh, consider uh, engaging, but as he's focused much more on the opportunity side, um, he wouldn't engage there necessarily. 
as much. Now, um, we've come to the end of our time. I do want to uh, give maybe Kirsten, I want to ask you one last question, and then Marie-Laure will close, um, one that I had reserved a little bit. Um, you know, you've you focused a lot on you know the problems, the issues. What's what, what are what are the big you know not so good water actors doing? Um, what gives you hope? Great question. Well, you know, I um, am obviously a bit biased, but you know, the Valley and Water Finance Initiative that we just launched, um, you know, is a tremendous opportunity, and I think um, you know we can make huge change and impact. Um, getting that underway. Um, you know, we've seen the impacts from Climate Action 100 plus in, in only five years' time, and so I'm just really um, chomping at the bit to, to get this off and going and, and having 64 plus investors engaging with 72 companies that really, you know, have a critical role to play in, in managing our water resources. I think we can really make some, some great on the ground impact. And, you know, coming out of World Water Week, as I mentioned, I'm just really inspired by the great work that is really going on. And we're not trying to reinvent the wheel whatsoever. We're going to be learning from all the, the good work that's going on and hopefully lift all boats um, through this engagement. So it's an opportunity opportunity also for folks to join us and to to really have a part in, in creating the impact. So I'm really excited about the change that we can collectively bring um, in managing our water resources in the coming years. Well, thank you very much to the panel. Maybe I, I, I quickly make an attempt at summarizing. So I think um, on one hand, what we surfaced is that it is, and the point that you made at the very end, that it is important no matter where, if, if they're even just only mainly in the, in the development world, to put pressure as an investor on those companies who are not using water in the right way and who could benefit from some of the companies that Cedric is investing in to, to value water more. And I think increasingly as that initiative grows, I'm sure it will also put pressure on companies who are doing the exact same thing in emerging markets. We also learned from you that there are some, and you described a very beautiful investable project, uh, that just need to be surfaced, that need to be shown, and there needs to be a way, um, perhaps, where we can find ways to say, maybe not uh, you know, equity investors, but people who are pre-equity investors, or even philanthropic capital that is looking for, um, but, you know, that is looking for solutions that, that are entrepreneurial, um, that that is visible. And I think the third point that we take away is that there is probably something there for blended finance but it needs to become more simple and that a conference like this where we talk in front of an audience is nice, but we probably need beyond that, you know, more work where we really sit down behind closed doors with, you know, industry, financial services, you know, and the, the sector uh, that, uh, that is, you know, the NGO sector to say, look, how can we, how can we properly structure this so that we can finance, uh, finance the projects? I think, a lot of goodwill is there, but it, that's, the, that's the most complicated part at the very end. So thank you very, very much for your attention, and let me, at the very, very end, actually a quick hand of applause for our panel, please. You were great, thank you. And Marie-Laure, let me hand to you for some closing remarks. Yeah, no, it's, it's tough to unpack all of this, right? But I think for me, the the big thing that comes out of this is just the the fact that everyone in their own area can act um that we shouldn't underestimate the power of collaboration and engagement right using our voice because every time we engage with a company on these topics um it actually gets the company to think about their overall water footprint and what that will do is it will then drive change throughout the value chain of that corporate and we heard someone from nestle earlier today say exactly that right they look at agricultural supply chains and then what happens happens is they actually end up financing also projects that need to occur because this is something that ends up reducing their risk across the board. So not to underestimate that power of engagement, but it is not enough. And we had that question coming from the audience um, that we need to also think outside the box and partner and start to think a little bit more about the outcomes we are trying to drive um, and not always focus on um, what money are we going to be making out of this, right? There are fundamental things that are important to us as human beings. If we don't have water, if we don't have air, if we don't have family and connection, um, you know, the bank account actually ultimately doesn't matter, um, or at least above a certain threshold, it actually doesn't bring all of that. So 
I think this is really key, how do we find ways to drive the capital where it needs to go? And so maybe on that note, you know, we're all going to go off and, and do the rest of this week. Um, part of my work is, is obviously um, head of, of ESG and stewardship at PICTE, but the other hat is, is actually president of Sustainable Finance Geneva. The conversation on this needs to continue because, as we said, we need to facilitate new solutions. We need to educate those that have the capital so we can meet in the middle and find the solutions we need for the future. So anyone that's interested in continuing the conversation, in driving the change, in joining the Valuing Water Initiative, um, in continuing the work in the community, um, please don't hesitate to come uh, to me afterwards because I think this is a conversation that needs to continue. Thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you to all of you for staying. It's late, it's been a long day. Um, and thank you for the future engagement you have on this topic. Have a lovely evening. <laughs>